Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, my beloved brothers and sisters. Alhamdulillah, we still together enjoying the blessings of Allah in these blessed nights of month of Ramadan. Tonight, I would like to share with you a beautiful and a very special thoughts about one of the most beautiful and special ayat in the Quran and the whole ayat of the Quran are special and beautiful. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us an ayah that calls ayat al-du'a, the supplication ayah and the connection with Allah. This ayah, Allah attached it to the ayat of Ramadan. That's the ayat talks about Ramadan. Allah add this ayat to ayat of al-siyam. Because Ramadan is the month of Allah and the month of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ayah says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ When my servants ask you about me, tell them that I am near. I respond to the call of one when he prays to me, so they should respond to me and have faith in me, so that they may be on the right path. Let's go together to with the Imam Ibn al-Arabi al-Andalusi Qaddas Allahu Sirra and let's hear from him his beautiful thoughts about this ayah. So the ayah has four parts. One is the su'al, the question from the servants who are seeking Allah and asking about Allah. Second one is the response of Allah that's telling us about the nearness of Allah. Third one is the response of Allah to the dua that comes from his servants. And the fourth one is the response of the servants to the guidance of Allah and receiving the teachings of Allah and let it reflect in the pureness to his heart. The first one, the first part is the su'al. The Imam said that, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي When my servants ask you about me. Imam ibn al-Arabi here told, about, told us about this ibad. Who are they, this ibad? He said, those who seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who turn from everything to the one thing, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through the ma'rifah of Allah, that's these people, as-salikun, al-talibun, المتوجهون إلى الله سبحانه وتعالى عن معرفته. So he described them as this as those who are seeking Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Allah described them as the seekers of Allah, those who seek Allah سبحانه وتعالى and search for Allah and they want to know more about Allah سبحانه وتعالى and they want to reach to Allah. So Allah is there. Target is their goal. They want to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reason of the su'al, they asking about Allah, because they have witnessed Allah through his universe, through his creation. So they witnessed his beauty and they witnessed his majesty and his strength and his power. And the reason of that witnessing is the interaction with the universe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the universe is the mirror of the creator. You don't see Allah himself, but you see his beauty and his majesty through the universe. So the universe is like a mirror. It shows you the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It shows you the majesty of Allah. So these servants, they interact with the universe of Allah then they witnessed Allah through this universe. Then they now, after witnessing that, they witness their self by witnessing the weakness of their self that they cannot survive without the one who has the power over the whole universe. So that's the, what they want to do is they want to know him more. They want to get to him. They want to connect with him. They want to benefit from his barakah, his blessings, his rahmah, and his power. So that means the first step of reaching to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and getting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the su'al, the question. And this is a question you don't ask anyone except the one who knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're asking the one who knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah says in the Quran, Allah said, الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَّامٍ ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى عَلَى الْعَرْشِ الرحمن 
فاسأل به خبيرا. The one who created heavens and earth in six days then have control over his throne which means over all his kingdom, his creation. Ar-Rahman. He is the Rahman, the most merciful one. فاسأل به خبيرا. So ask about him someone who knows. So when you want to ask about something, then you ask those who are expert on that thing. So you ask about Allah, then you need to ask, you need to know about Allah, then you need to ask the people of Allah. They will tell you better about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second part of this ayah is the response of Allah. When they ask about Allah, the response from Allah came saying, that's inni qareeb. فَإِنِّي قريب. I am close, I'm near to them. So here Allah shows us the dhuhur that Allah appears to his creation through his creation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appears to his creation through his creation. Then if Allah is appear and clear and we can see, why do we ask about something is known? Usually you ask about something unknown. You don't ask about something known. The response of that is that as much as Allah is visible in this universe as much Allah is invisible as well. Because the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the main thing about him. So the nur, you don't see the nur, the light, but you see things through the nur. But the light itself, you don't see it, but you see everything through this nur. So Allah is the nur of samawati wal ard. Allah nur of samawati wal ard. So through that nur, which is through Allah, we were able to see ourselves and see everything in this universe. So because of that thing, the servants thought that Allah is hidden and we don't know is he near or far, how can we get to him? So that's why the response came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَإِنِّي قريب. I am near to them. And there is a beautiful meaning here in the words of Qareeb. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he responds to the servants use the word Qareeb? While they, he could have used any other word, but why Allah chose the word Qareeb? Because the word Qareeb itself, it gives you a feeling of security. It makes you feel secure. If, if the strong one is near you, then you feel safe, secure. And that weakness of servants needs that feeling to make them feel secure in their life and Allah provide us that feeling the second one is that your goal to show us to show you that your goal Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are seeking to get to Allah is close qareeb so that means it's easy for you to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but if you know that Allah is far you might give up in taking the way to Allah because it's too far but when you know your target, your goal is close, is near, that will encourage you to walk to Allah. So that's here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us other courage. All of us to go to him and keep walking to him. He said, I'm very close, just turn to me. So that's why the moment you turn your heart towards Allah, you'll find yourself before Allah, between his hands. All you need to do, just turn your heart, say, Ya Allah, and you are there between his hands subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third thing what the Imam said here is the ijabat al-du'a, which means the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the du'a. 
Allah says, Ujibu da'wat al-da'i idha da'an. So the Imam al-Arabi says here, the response of Allah to his servants comes like this, that Allah responds to the servants based on two things, based on the hal, the status of the servants at that moment, the moment of the dua, and based on the ability of the servants of receiving and giving for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which means Imam al-Arabi taught us two important pillars of responding the dua by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his servant. That is the dua comes, uh, will be response from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on this. The dua comes from the servants to Allah based on the hal of the servants, based on the hal, the status of the heart of the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not based on the words that comes from the tongue of the servants during the dua like using a fancy word, a beautiful words, that's all good. But the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to your dua will not be based on the words you use, will be based on the status of your heart. If this heart is broken and feel the need and wants the connection with Allah, then the response of Allah will be faster to the feelings of the heart, to the status of the heart. So that's why during the dua, Allah looks at your heart and Allah sees the hal, the situation, the status, the feelings of your heart at that time. The broken heart are always closer to Allah and are always have a better chance of receiving the response of their dua from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah gives for the broken heart more than anything else. There is a beautiful secret in this I need you to pay attention to. That's one of the signs of rahmatullah uh, on, upon his creation and the signs of Allah's love to his creation is that Allah breaks their hearts through his destiny. Breaking the hearts of servants through the destiny of Allah is a sign of Allah's love and rahmah. How will that make sense? I tell you how. Because when Allah breaks your heart through his destiny, when the destiny of Allah breaks your heart, what happens to you? You turn to Allah and you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the modesty, with a broken heart, with a weakness, which is these are the status of the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You come to Allah with full of need to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his mercy. So this destiny, it breaks your heart. This destiny is the reason and the secret of your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These type of destinies that breaks the hearts of the servants of Allah, which many people hate, is actually the reason and the secret of your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you must somehow find the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through these destinies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the reason why it happens this destiny, it breaks your heart, then brings you closer to Allah. Then you turn to Allah. The connection with Allah is the secret of the happiness because Allah heals your heart and Allah responds to your dua and Allah has the power over everything in this life and Allah can provide you with everything you wish in this life and even more. The second pillar of it, the Imam al Arabi told us, is the response of Allah will be based on the status of the heart at the moment of the dua. The second pillar is based on the ability of the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how much he is available or able to turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to empty his heart from everything but Allah, and how much the servant is willing to sacrifice for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Allah says, فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي So let them respond to me. They should respond to me. This is the istidad, the ability of responding to Allah. How much you are willing to respond to Allah? How much you are willing to give for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And Imam al-Arabi said this comes بِتَصْفِيَةُ الْإِسْتِعْدَادِ بِالزُّهْدِ وَالْعِبَادَةِ And that ability comes in two ways and two pillars, which is one is a zuhud, to have a zuhud on the dunya. That's you want nothing except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you need something, you need it as, as a means to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So emptying your heart from everything. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the second thing is your ability 
two responds to Allah, which means how much you are willing to put effort in worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in giving for the sake of Allah, how much you are willing to sacrifice and give for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the two pillars as well. The response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be based on. Imam al-Arabi said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you to himself. He does not call you to eat or drink. He is calling you to himself. And Allah is teaching you the suluk, how to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last thing is that the, the response of the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is Imam al-Arabi said that when you purify your heart for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then your heart becomes a mirror. Through this mirror, you can see the nur of Allah that will reflect into all your life and into your way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The verse of the dua in Surah Al-Baqarah is one of the most beautiful ayat and all ayat of the Quran are beautiful, of course, but it is an amazing ayah how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala add this ayah to the ayat of Siyam. Allah talks about fasting. Dua is something else, but Allah match them together in Surah Al-Baqarah to show you this leads to this and this leads to that. Let all of us, inshallah, turn to Allah at this night and at this moment. Ask him for all your wishes. This ayah, I hope, inshallah, gave us a better understanding for the meaning of the dua and the conditions of it. So I would suggest to all of you to go back to this message again. It will be available on YouTube to go back to it and listen to it and again and again. There's a very important, beautiful points. If you get to understand them, practice them in your life. Is going to make a big difference in your life, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khair and thanks for listening and watching. Barakallahu feekum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Ramadan and Eid Mubarak to you and your family. Chef Ami will cater traditional home cooked meals from our kitchen to yours. We create our own authentic mouth-watering meals from scratch. Chef Ami has been nominated for various home cooking awards all around the world, and we are so excited to start cooking for your family. Our catering ranges from appetizers, such as samosas, chicken rolls, pokoras, chicken croquettes, various types of shots, to main course meals specializing in continental and Pakistani cuisine. We know that we will not disappoint. For the working family who does not have time to cook, we offer special services by creating a weekly meal plan catered to your family. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Chef Ami. Jazakallah for the opportunity in advance to cater for your next party and your next meal. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Welcome to our first episode of our Ramadan Reminder Series. I welcome you and your families. And I pray and hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you all the best of this month of Ramadan, accepts all of your good deeds and your fasts and your du'as. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with us all. I want to start off by uh, reminding us that whenever we go into this month of Ramadan, we should have the hope of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and bettering ourselves as a human being uh, and better ourselves as a Muslim. And uh, in the month of Ramadan, we have to understand that Allah has magnified the, the, the reward of doing good deeds more so than throughout the rest of the year. So it's, it's important for us to try our best to acquire as many good deeds and blessings as possible in this month. We know that the main action is the fast that we do in the month of Ramadan. And the reward of that fast is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we don't know how much we are about to be rewarded in the akhirah for the fast that we do. And the action of fasting is so pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That just the fact that we're doing that action, we should be so happy about it. Uh, despite how difficult and strenuous it is on our mind mentally and our bodies physically. And, and it is it's true, it's okay to say that. Uh, but that's why the reward is so high that we are doing this action only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no way in our like no one in the right mind would fast for anyone except for God himself for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and he's the only one that really knows if we're fasting or not uh, so if we think about it in that perspective inshallah it'll make the fast easier and make it more fruitful just the action of fasting 
Uh, moving forward, I want to give us three tips and goals that we can set for ourselves in the month of Ramadan. The first uh, goal would be setting a spiritual goal, uh, some type of ibadah, some type of worship. And the second goal would be some type of physical goal that we tie, uh, we set some type of activity physically that we do to make ourselves physically more uh, better and more active. And I need that advice more more than anyone. I'm really hoping that I can use the month of Ramadan to increase my fitness and my physical health. So that would be really good for me, myself to do. And I advise all of us to do the same thing. Uh, the third advice or goal that I would say we should have is a social goal, something that we do to uh, make humanity better, something that we do to make our akhlaq and our mannerisms better. And uh, I'm going to go and break down all three of these goals uh, very quickly and hopefully simply. The first goal, the spiritual goal, some type of ibadah, some type of worship that we do. Uh, I would advise that we pray Quran after Salat al-Fajr. And the reason I say that is because there's multiple blessings for doing that. And it's not too difficult for us to do it. Uh, after Salat al-Fajr, just you know, for a couple of minutes, if we can just uh, open the Quran and read it and consistently do it. And um, that would be great. And the reason I say uh, do it for a couple of minutes is because that's what all of these three goals is kind of revolving around because we should try to do these goals in a way that we can consistently do them. And it doesn't have to be too much, something small, but but consistent because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a small but consistent deed. And he says, um, I'll, the Prophet sallam, actually says, and a hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a small but consistent goal uh, or the small but consistent good deed. The reason I say that uh, like so much is because shaitan wants us to do like a big deed. Like let's say in the month of Ramadan, we start praying and reading Quran more and we should, we should. But if we start doing it in a way that we don't ever touch the Quran or do ibadah or worship or charity outside of that month, or we don't do it for a couple of years, that's exactly what he wants us to do. Uh, and it turns into a, kind of a trap, right? Uh, and I, I'm going on a tangent right now, but I just wanted to mention and make sure everybody knows how important it is that we do a small but consistent deed. To start off, I would say Salatul Fajr. Right after that, we read some Quran. And the reason for that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna Quran al Fajr kana mashhuda, that indeed the Quran of Fajr is the one that is witnessed by the angels and it is uh, filled with blessings. So if we're already up for a sehri and we're going to pray Fajr because it's so easy for us to do that, we already woke up to eat, uh, then may as well add a couple of minutes after we're done Fajr and read the Quran. And the second blessing that we can attain is the blessing that the Prophet ﷺ said we get for staying in our prayer spot after we are done praying instead of hastily getting up and going. Uh, there's tons of blessings just for staying in our spot. So may as well read Quran during that time. Uh, and the second goal is that we can start adopting would be like some type of physical activity. I would say go for a walk after iftari or do some type of physical act, even if it's like five, 10 pushups, whatever we can do. I need to do that more than anyone else. That's why I'm saying it. But I think that it's important for us to do some type of physical activity to make ourselves physically better. Um, not something so much that it'll exert us to the point where we're not able to because we are fasting for the whole day, but something easy, something simple, but just to get our bodies moving. And the third goal, small goal, but consistent would be the social goal. And that would be to do something nice for our parents every single day. It could be like getting them a glass of water for iftari or sehri or just smiling at our parents. Um, it doesn't have to be limited to our parents, but I would emphasize the parents because the reward to be good to our parents is literally the, the best reward we can acquire. Uh, but if we can think of something else, like it could be cleansing our heart from any ill feelings for anybody and uh, just, you know, for, uh, forgiving and forgetting um, to act nicer and have more patience when we're uh, when we're dealt with people that we don't like or we someone says something that we don't like and just practice more patience. But something small and consistent that we can do, I would say. Um, inshallah, that's what I would give to myself and for the rest of us to do every single day in the month of Ramadan. I think that's like a small but attainable goal that we can have. Um, and it's very important that we do it small and consistently, not doing it more than we are able to do. One day, let's say we're feeling it and, you know, physically or spiritually, we're just on a spiritual high and we're like, oh, I can read this much more. I can give this much more charity. And then Later on, we don't do it anymore. We just give up on it because we think that 
that one day of us reading Quran is uh, is okay for another 50 days or a, like five years, whatever it is. Um, I the reason I like and not to say that that one sitting of Quran is not important. I'm just saying that in order for us to adopt good habits and to consistently do well, we have to pick something that's small that we can do on our worst day, not on our best day, something that we can do on our worst day. Uh, because let's say we are feeling that we can do more, give more charity or do more of an ibadah. I would say pick an amount that even if you are feeling really, really good about yourself, that you don't hold yourself to that standard. Let's say one day you and I feel like we can read for half an hour, one hour, two hours of Quran, or we can give like a lot of charity, then fine. I'm not saying don't do it. If you can financially and physically manage to do that, then by all means do it. But do not hold yourself to that standard every other day moving forward. The standard that we set is that five minutes of Quran or that one dollar a day of sadaqah, whatever it is. That's the standard we set we have to do. But if one day we feel like doing more, by all means do it. But don't hold yourself to that standard every single day because it's going to be too difficult to consistently do it. That would be my best form of advice for myself and everyone. And inshallah, may Allah make it easy for all of us to together get the maximum out of this month. And may Allah make it easy, successful, accept all of our good deeds, be pleased with us, accept our fasts, and our du'as and make this month easy and successful. With that, I conclude and until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Do you remember a time when you have come back from an event after hearing an amazing lecture? The speaker's words still echo when you imagine it. Muslim Sound will ensure each one of your events will feel and sound like a live cinematic experience. We cater to Muslim culture needs, providing high quality sound, video, and top of the line audio visual equipment. We all remember those events where nothing seemed to be going right. Think about low or disturbing sounds and interrupted video that can impact your image in front of your dear and special audience. Whenever you are planning an event, at the masjid, at a convention, at a wedding, at a banquet hall, at your business, or at your home. Please let us hear your voice so you can experience all your events with Muslim Sound. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. In today's history segment, we will talk about someone who was never really recognized anywhere in her life. A person dehumanized with no family, not even one person to call a friend, who lived a life of slavery and indentured servitude to various so-called masters, abused, broken, and invisible to the eyes of the people. This Abyssinian woman was a slave to a Bedouin Mushrik tribe in the outskirts of the deserts far, far away from her home. One day, she was ordered to carry an expensive material that was beautified with jewelry used to show the status of the woman who wore it. Now, naturally, this is a very sensitive task, so the slave woman must take care. But out of nowhere, a bird came and stole it from her hands. When the Bedouins came to find out, they accused her of stealing it and beat her very badly, not accepting anything she had to say. She was absolutely voiceless. But then the bird came and dropped the expensive shawl between all of them. And that's when the tribe realized that they've done their slave girl a huge evil. So they felt bad. Yes, even their hard hearts can feel bad. And let her go. But as a black woman wandering the hot deserts of the foreign Arab lands, she was more alone than ever. She doesn't belong to any tribe, which is like today. Not having any country. No citizenship just invisible no one knows her no one cares about her however she heard of this place called medina 
I'm sure you all have as well. Where the poor, the misplaced, the downtrodden, and the weak are empowered. She entered the blessed city of Medina, passing many people, still invisible. Even you and I won't recognize her worth. But the Prophet wasallam instantly knew the value of this Abyssinian woman, and he knew instantly what kind of suffering she went through. She was not like any other former slaves who make up a huge population of the Muslims. Upon meeting the Prophet wasallam, she right there and then became a Muslim, and she interpreted that her entire life suffering was meant for her just to meet the Prophet ﷺ. To stand in his presence made it all worth it. She found the religion of Islam that finally uplifted her. And her friend, her first friend, was none other than our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. The Prophet made her a house even inside the Prophet's masjid, a home inside a home, similar to how Prophet Zakaria salam built for Maryam salam in the masjid. Do we still not know who she is? Is she still invisible to us as she was invisible to everyone else? Her name was Umm Mihjan. Still not ringing any bells? The woman who cleaned the masjid, perhaps. She was living in the masjid and took it upon herself, despite the fact that she's old and weak, to clean the mosque. She did not exempt herself from serving in the cause of Allah. She cleaned the mosque without anyone telling her to do so. She saw the opportunity and she stayed consistent in it as well. She never belittled her task as a woman who cleaned the masjid. And she never cared that she never had any degrees or any kind of high status. It never bothered her that no one recognized her. Eventually, one morning, the Prophet ﷺ missed her. He asked the companions, Where is the woman who was sweeping the mosque? And they said to the Prophet that she died at the night time and you were sleeping and we didn't want to bother you. So we did the Janazah prayer and we buried her, thinking that she was of no one of any value. The Prophet ﷺ became angry and sad. Angry because how could the Sahaba not see the value in her? And sad that a wali of Allah died and he didn't get to pray the janazah for her. And so the Prophet ﷺ called the companions and told them, show me her grave. There he performed a janazah prayer and said, these graves are full of darkness and engulf its dwellers, but Allah enlightens it by the virtue of my prayers. She is the only Sahaba to have received two Janazah prayers, one by the greatest generation in the history of mankind, and second by the greatest man in the history of mankind. May Allah have mercy on Umm Mahjan, a poor but great woman who the Prophet ﷺ prayed over her tomb. The story of Umm Mahjan deserves more than just seven minutes, but there are lessons learned from her story. Lessons that we can take today to apply to our everyday life. Her story stands as a great example of how Muslims should be how we shouldn't belittle people we don't know their stories 
we don't know where people come from, yet we look down on people because of profession and other things like that. And we belittle even tasks. We do we not know the merit of picking up one small piece of garbage in the masjid or even outside? What happens when you remove a rock from the street that could bother someone? There are great rewards for small yet consistent acts fi sabilillah. For stories like this and more, please subscribe and stay tuned.